Hi guys, this is Tim Vasquez with Texas Weather Channel and Weather Graphics, and I wanted to do another installment of the Radar Workshop. I'm in uh, GR Level 2. This is a program written by Mike Gibson. It's a radar viewer, and GR Level 2 focuses on Level 2 NixRad data. So it's so this is basically the highest resolution radar product that we get from the NixRad sites. So using this program, I can zoom in on storms and get in really close. I need to shut off Facebook there. Let me go over and do that real quick. Where's Facebook? There it is. Okay. Getting back to our radar here. One other useful thing in uh, GR Level 2 is you can load up shape files. So here I've got Texas streets loaded in and I can zoom in and if I'm looking at base velocity I can see exactly whether a circulation is bearing down on Elm Street or Main Street or whatever. So anyway, I'm going to take that away because that's going to clutter the map too much. So we have a couple supercells moving into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Fort Worth is up near the top of the screen. Dallas is up at the top left and we got one, two, three cells here. Now the one in the middle is just south of the Fort Worth radar site. You see it right there. That's near uh, Spinks Airport and it's being degraded by all this ground clutter. So I'm going to move this forward. We'll get the storm out of that ground clutter and take a closer look at it. When it's directly over the radar site, there's what we call a cone of silence. If I do a cross section and look at all the uh, different tilts, you can see that there's an area up above 5, 10, 15,000 feet where there's no radar data. Okay, so you see that the radar is right in here and it's pointing upwards. This is the highest tilt that we can get. The radar beam can't get any higher than about 20 degrees. So there's this whole void that exists. And we usually compensate to some extent by using other radars to fill in that gap. And then eventually the storm will move on off and we'll get a better look at it again. So I'm going to get it past this uh, ground clutter area so this doesn't get too confusing. Okay, so now it's about 10 miles northeast of the radar site. So we'll take a closer look at that supercell right here. This is Fort Worth off to the left, and Arlington is right here, and Grand Prairie is off to the right. And you'll see that our supercell has developed pretty well. It's got the classic triangular appearance. We have the higher reflectivities shifted away from the center of the storm. Let me show you the center of the storm. Okay, so right here I'm painting out the bulk of the uh, thunderstorm. Actually, it goes way over here. And you see the higher reflectivities are kind of packed in this area. When a storm is not severe, we normally see those higher reflectivities more in the center of the storm rather than off to one side. So that's another indicator that the storm is severe without having the benefit of any spotters or higher level reflectivity data. This is just looking at one frame and we can tell that it's severe. And of course we have the classic hook echo. Okay, so now we're looking at the storm at 1831Z. This is gonna be about, uh, they're on daylight savings, so this is gonna be 1.31 p.m. Storm is moving into Arlington as we can see here. And I'm gonna show you a trick right here. See the circulation? Let me draw that on here. This is the implied circulation in the storm. It's gonna be something like that. And if we go to the velocity product, in fact, let me put a mark right where that debris ball is so we don't lose our place. Okay. I'm going to go to velocity. See that? There's something going on right there. I'm going to zoom in so you get a close look at that. Compare that with the reflectivity and with the velocity. What this is showing, we have to keep in mind that the radar is down to the southwest. We always have to know where the radar is when we're using these velocity products. There, that's a little bit better. And we also have to remember that the uh, red shades are always outbound velocities. That's kind of a standard convention. These are positive outbound velocities. Cool or green shades are reserved for inbound velocities. So here's the wind right here going towards the radar. 
This implies that there is probably some uh, rotation like that. that. This is a couplet. We have very strong velocities right there, outbound, very strong inbound. Now you notice that there's a speck of green. Why is there a speck of green in the middle of this red area? It's like we have very strong outbound and then this seems to suggest strong inbound. Well, the reason for that is the velocity data is aliased. There's a maximum speed limit for pulse pair processing radars like this one. So we use this uh, de-alias option right here, and that goes away, and we get proper values. In fact, let me scroll this up here so you can see the bottom of the uh, graphic. When I set the cursor here over that area, look down, look down here. See this right here? This is a readout of what the velocity is where the cursor is. So in that little speck right there, we've got 60 knots outbound. In the inbound part of the couplet, we have 32 knots inbound. So that's about uh, 110 knots a shear, which is, which is pretty good. Now one question you might be asking is why the velocities outbound here are a whole lot larger than the inbound velocities. Remember we had minus 28 right here and 71 outbound. That's because the storm motion is uh, contributing to the outbound velocity right here and it's offsetting the inbound that we have right here. Okay, so one trick for getting rid of that is you take the outbound velocity, which is 70 knots outbound, take the inbound, which is negative 30, and you add them together. That gives us a value of positive 40. Then you divide by two and that gives us 20. So that's the figure we're gonna use. So we'll go up to here, we'll set storm motion. We'll set that to the origin, which is 220 degrees and our speed of 20 knots. And now we can use the storm relative product. Make sure we have, let's see here. Okay, so now our outbound velocity is 40. Got one little spike of 52 right there. Inbound is negative 50, so now our couplet is balanced. We're getting kind of a balanced reading. So this is kind of like the true storm relative velocities within the storm. Now one thing I like to look at is the couplet size. I can do that by clicking on, uh, let's see here. So I can do that by dropping a point right here, place marker there. Then I go to the other side and I look at the distance reading that I'm seeing at the bottom of the screen. So this high, this area of high velocity here is about half a mile from the other part of the couplet. This is a pretty tight signature and it tells me that we're probably looking at tornadic winds. When it's larger, like over one mile, I'm usually looking at a mesocyclone, especially when we're over about a mile and a half to two miles. But in the worst of the severe storms like El Reno, those couplets will be averaging probably two miles in diameter. So it really depends on the storm. There's no rule of thumb, really. So we know we have about 100 knots of shear across half a mile. That's definitely in the tornadic, tornadic range. So where's the tornado? I'm going to put it at the midpoint between this couplet right there. And I can go to base reflectivity, pretty much right in the center of that debris ball. And who's under the gun? I can go back to that GIS and show the shape files. And... I'll zoom in on that. I'll go back to velocity right there. Actually, we can't see that too well, so I'll just go back to this for now. So this pretty much tells you right down to the block who's probably getting uh, damaged. So Spring Creek Road right here, Misty Wood Drive, all this is probably in bad shape. And remember that this is kind of like, we're, we're looking at a radius here of about a quarter mile. So that's about that gives us about half a mile of diameter. So this whole neighborhood right here was uh, definitely in, in trouble that day. As far as what's causing this debris ball, well, when you have a tornado, when you have a tornado move through an area and pick up things like sheet metal, those are highly reflective, 
reflects a lot of backscatter back to the radar and shows up as high intensities. So we're talking things like nails, um, pieces of houses, ducting, that kind of stuff. That really gets in here and, and enhances the uh, signature. And you can see it on spectrum width right here. This is a very underused product and it's missing from a lot of weather websites. But I think that this is really elemental to tornado forecasting. And this is showing us a very high diversity of, of uh, velocity in that debris ball. There's, you have a whole bunch of different sizes of particles within that debris ball. You have like large pieces of sheet metal, small, uh, I don't know, pieces of uh, trash, that kind of thing. And they all move at very, very different speeds as contrasted with rain, which is kind of like all moving the uniform velocity downward. So that gives us very high diversity right there. And that kind of confirms the radar appearance, the reflectivity appearance of that debris ball. So that with the velocity and the spectrum width all agree that there's a tornado on the ground right there. So you, when you see all that, you definitely want to get the warnings out. And you can go ahead and go to the higher tilts up to one one degree. This is about 895 feet above uh, sea level. Actually, I better check that. I'm not 100% sure how it's displayed in GR level 2. Go back to the radar site. Yeah, okay, that's above ground level. So AGL. So I'll go back here. Yeah, so this is 530 feet above ground level at 0 0.5. As we go higher, we can still see the debris ball. This is up at 1,200 feet. Go up higher, we're up at 1,400 feet. And we'll go to the higher tilts. As we go higher, we pick up the bounded weak echo region, which is in here. This is, let me draw a 3D graph here. See that right there? This is a beware, B-W-E-R. So this is the strong updraft that's streaming in, let me draw that, from the southeast, rising rapidly into the storm. And a lot of the precip is kind of delayed. It doesn't form until it's at higher levels here. So we end up with this kind of upward wedge that goes up into the storm. And then the precip cascades are over here. And there's some precip falling out right here too. Here's another cross-section from northwest to southeast. This shows the uh, precip falling and kind of uh, dispersing as it reaches the ground. This is not back where the tornado is. This is more just in the precip area itself, the forward flank downdraft. If I want to look at the 3D structure around the tornado, let me go back to this. Uh, yeah, we'll do a cross-section from north to south through the hook echo. See that right there? And you can see that what we have basically here is the precip falling out and getting swept into the mesocyclone. So most of this right here in the center is part of the hook echo itself. Here's a cross section through the debris ball going from west to east. And you can see it's mostly concentrated near the surface. This is about, uh, this right here is about 5,000 feet. And then this is up here at 10,000 feet. So this is a dis distinctly low level signature. This is not from precept falling directly down. This is uh, the debris. So here's one more look at the storm before I close, close out this module. I'm gonna draw a couple of the areas real quick. In the southern part of the storm, we have the mesocyclone area. See right there? Big meso. I didn't talk about the meso too much in this module. This broad scale circulation is basically the meso, and the tighter circulation right there is the tornado itself. If I go up to higher tilts, I can probably pick up the mesocyclone a little bit better. Probably have to go up way up high. See that right there? This is up at about uh, 8,000 feet. And you can see the, the, the circulation is kind of broadened out a little bit. From here to this part of the storm, 
that is about uh, what I have to do is set the marker and read that off at the bottom. So now we've widened out to about three miles. If we go up to higher tilts, it continues to broaden out. Let me go back to base velocity. Okay. The storm motion is a little bit higher up aloft, so we, what we have to do is increase the uh, storm motion to like 50 knots or so. We'll do 50. And now you can see the mesocyclone up at about 20,000 feet has a diameter of probably about three miles so it's pretty compact there so let me draw out the basic areas of the storm that we just looked at we have the mesocyclone basically in this area and this is the updraft area basically this whole region where this where there's there's this concavity ahead of the hook echo this is all updraft and there's probably an updraft base uh, basically in this area. Out to the north, forward flight downdraft in this area. And then off to the south. Basically in this area, we're looking at the uh, rear flight downdraft, kind of feeding into that back side of the storm. So remember aloft, we have the bounded weak echo region right here at, uh, looks like Pantigo. So I'm going to draw my cross section through that and just show you that real quick. That shows us that bounded weak echo region. Remember I was talking about the inflow going up into the storm? I found that this area right ahead of the bee weir and underneath it, this is a prolific uh, lightning area. It looks very stormy. So this is a, actually a good area to get thunderstorm shots if you're chasing the storm. Of course, I don't recommend that without training, but this is kind of like where you want to be basically in this uh, unsettled area right in here. So there is a bit of a lightning risk when you're hanging out there. Up to the north, if you get into that and you're chasing, you start getting in the precip and it starts getting more difficult to see the tornado itself. If you go to the south, you're looking northwest and your tornado is kind of like backdropped by all this rain. It's a lot harder to see it because your grayish tornado blends in with a grayish precipitation area. But when you look to the southwest, the precip curtains are a lot more light and it's a lot more easy to see the tornado itself. Anyway, that's about all I want to do for this module be so it doesn't go on too long and maybe in the next series we can look at other storms. I save all of these thunderstorm events. If I go to my cases directory, you see I've got stuff from 2015 going back to 2013 got uh, fires, stuff in West Virginia, Aurora Hailstone. You remember there was like a six-inch hailstone that dropped out of that storm about 10 years ago, and I got stuff going all the way back to first next rad from Oklahoma in 1991. I'll just close with a quick look at that. Okay, that's probably level two stuff, so let me... F I'm sorry, that's probably level three stuff. So some of the earliest level two stuff I have is uh, Hurricane Hurricane Andrew. You can see it right there. This is a uh, Minnesota. Uh, yeah, Minnesota. <laughs> this is Florida. So here we've got uh, Fort Myers. Out here we've got Miami, and you can see that the resolution of this radar is a lot worse. The radars were not as good back in those days, and the data was a lot more coarse. So this is about as good as you could get back in the time, back at the time. And that really shows you how well the radar technology has improved since then. So we've got some great tools nowadays, and we'll take a look at more of this stuff tomorrow and maybe into the weekend. And I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.